A closed system inside a fume hood, such as a Schlenk line, is an alternative option for the use of pyrophoric materials. Many pyrophoric chemicals release noxious or flammable gases upon decomposition and are often stored with a solvent. Both are reasons which require the proper ventilation of a fume hood. Schlenk lines come in a variety of shapes and sizes and serve different purposes. There are Schlenk line variants that use positive pressure and do not require a vacuum pump, removing the vacuum hazard from the system. Schlenk lines can either use nitrogen or argon gas, but argon is preferred. Consult with ASU EHS regarding Schlenk line modifications. In this procedure, the transfer of organolithium is carried out in a fume hood equipped with two gas manifolds connected via a series of valves. This is a typical setup of a Schlenk line and includes key considerations for the setup and operation. The following steps should form the framework of the lab-specific procedure and be documented in the SOP. To begin, one of the gas manifolds connects to a vacuum source and the other an inert gas source. The inert gas must be high purity and dry. The gas will pass through the manifold and is released into the atmosphere through a silicon, fluorinated, or other non-flammable and low reactivity oil bubbler. The bubbler provides two to five pounds per square inch of positive pressure and prevents air from entering the manifold. The regulator at the tank will display the pressure setting ranging from two to five pounds of pressure. The bubble rate serves as a visual indicator of the inert gas flow and the respective pressure release. If too low, there is a risk of getting oil in the line, and if too high, the pressure can pop open parts of the apparatus. An exit bubbler line equipped with a needle must be set up to allow for the flushing of reagent vessels and other containers that are not hooked up to the vacuum. A vacuum pump connected to the manifold provides the vacuum. A liquid nitrogen trap is used between the manifold and the pump to prevent contaminants from entering the pump or escaping into the atmosphere. The inert gas and vacuum can be supplied to the reagent bottle or reaction apparatus by a series of valves. These are connected to tubing that can be terminated with the appropriate needle or ground glass joint connections. Valves that switch back and forth between the vacuum and inert gas functions must be labeled and well understood before beginning. Glassware should be prepared overnight in a drying oven at 125 degrees Celsius or 140 degrees Celsius for four hours and assembled while hot to prevent atmospheric moisture deposition. Always inspect glassware for any cracks or defects and dispose of any defective glassware. During assembly, all joints are greased to ensure a tight seal wherever ground glass to glass connections are made. Rubber septa or stoppers are installed on any openings to the system. The system should then be cooled by flushing with dry argon and drawing vacuum down for at least three cycles. Argon is the preferred choice as it is heavier than air. If argon is unavailable, nitrogen can be used. The vacuum pump should be switched on and allowed to pump down its side of the system setup to the valve that separates it from the manifold. Ensure that all other valves leading to the manifold are closed. Open the line between the vacuum and the manifold. Next, open the valve leaning to the glassware to evacuate as determined. The amount of time the flask is under low pressure will vary depending on the needs of the experiment and the efficiency of the vacuum pump. When switching away from vacuum mode, close the valve between the flask and the Schlenk manifold first. Then close the valve between the vacuum and the manifold. Open the valve leading to the inert gas slowly so as to help reduce the chances of oil backflow. If oil backflow issues continue, consider specialized bubblers or filters to prevent backflow. Also consider using Teflon pin valves to allow for finer control. These valves break easily and can shatter glassware if over tightened, but allow the valve to be open much more slowly. Solvents should be purified, meaning air and moisture free. Solvent purification is beyond the scope of this course. A solvent purification system is the safest way and best practice to prepare solvents for use. Alternatively, the freeze pump thaw procedure is an effective way to degas solvents for use, but carries a heightened risk of shattering glass. 
If your lab decides to use this procedure, take appropriate safety precautions, such as the use of a blast shield. Hygroscopic solvents will be transferred to the reaction apparatus with the aid of a syringe or cannula to avoid absorbing moisture from the air. High boiling point solvents can be degassed of any trapped air by alternatively purging the system with the inert gas and then evacuating the system using the connected vacuum source. The septum will later be pierced with a needle or cannula to transfer the pyrophoric liquid. The reaction solvent and other non-pyrophoric materials are added to the reaction apparatus. Any remaining openings are sealed with an appropriately sized septum or stopper. Any flammable materials not required for the reaction must be capped and removed from the fume hood. At this point, additional PPE for handling pyrophoric materials, such as a flame-resistant lab coat, along with goggles and a face shield, is required before the organolithium bottle is transported from the refrigerator to the fume hood. Use a secondary container, such as the can the reagent was shipped in. At the fume hood, the reagent bottle will be clamped in place above a secondary container located next to the reaction apparatus. The organolithium reagent can be accessed by puncturing the Teflon seal located under the cap of the Sure Seal bottle. The needle used for a syringe transfer should be no larger than 16 gauge and be long enough to easily reach into the reagent while the syringe is being held upright. Before and after use, inspect the septum for any damage or elasticity loss. If degradation is determined, the reagent should be disposed of as hazardous waste. A failure of the septum can result in a fire. To prolong the lifetime of the seal, avoid puncturing the seal in a previous puncture location. Instead, penetrate the seal from the side in a region that has not been previously punctured. Use one needle per puncture. The septum is first penetrated with a line that supplies a slight positive pressure to the bottle from the inert gas source. The system must be in passive mode for this to occur. Passive mode prevents overpressurization of a container when an exit bubbler is not available. It is achieved by giving the inert gas supply access to a bubbler protected exit. This access can be switched on and off. The tubing used for the inert gas line can be supported with a clamp to avoid any strain on the seal and the tip of the needle will be kept above the level of the liquid. A second puncture is from the bubbler protected exit line. Inserting an exit bubbler and switching to active mode allows the inert gas to purge the headspace above the reagent. This purge ensures that any air that may have intruded during storage has been removed. This purge should not be allowed to continue for too long due to the risk of evaporating off the solvent and concentrating the reagent. After the headspace purge, switch back to passive mode and remove the exit bubbler to make room for the puncture that is used to withdraw the pyrophoric liquid with the aid of a syringe or cannula. Syringe transfers are used to transfer small quantities, no more than 20 milliliters of a pyrophoric liquid. The syringe must be capable of containing twice the volume being transferred. Never use a non-locking plastic syringe and needle. A backup syringe should be stored nearby in case it is needed. Any syringes used to transfer dry solvent or reagents should be flushed at least three times by drawing in inert gas and expelling the gas into the fume hood. Needle lines supplying argon to the apparatus could become contaminated or cause needle sticks if left free hanging inside the hood. These lines can be safely stored in a septum sealed desiccator. After flushing the syringe with inert gas, depress the plunger and stick the needle syringe in the desiccator septum for safe storage. Ensure the apparatus is still in passive mode, supplying inert gas to the reagent vessel. Push the needle into the reagent bottle until it is below the liquid level. With the syringe upright, pull gently on the plunger, watching the inert gas bubbler closely to ensure that the liquid draw rate does not outpace the inert gas flow. This will prevent air intrusion. Any excess reagent and entrained bubbles will be forced back into the reagent bottle by depressing the plunger. When the required amount of pyrophoric liquid is in the syringe, withdraw the needle until it rests in the headspace of the reagent container, then draw in a cushion of inert gas above the liquid level inside the syringe. 
Transfer the pyrophoric liquid to the reaction apparatus by puncturing the septum and expelling the contents of the syringe into the reaction vessel at the desired rate. After delivery, draw in an inert gas cushion to the syringe, then withdraw the needle from the vessel. Any fluid remaining in the syringe can be transferred back to the reagent container or a septum sealed inert gas filled quenching container by turning the syringe upside down. The syringe and needle must be quenched and cleaned so it does not become a hazard during future use. Start by drawing solvent up into the syringe and then expelling it into a beaker of the appropriate quench agent. Repeat as needed. Next, draw up an appropriate amount of quench agent. If the needle becomes blocked during this step, detach the needle from the syringe, draw quencher into the syringe, reattach the needle, and push out the blockage. If the blockage persists, soak the needle in an appropriate quencher for at least one hour and dispose of the needle in a sharps container. If there is no needle blockage, clean according to your lab's procedure and store in an oven or desiccator for future use. Cannula transfers are used to transfer volumes greater than 20 milliliters of a pyrophoric liquid. Push the tip of the cannula into the headspace of the reagent bottle and allow the inert gas to purge the headspace for about one minute by inserting an exit bubbler and switching to active mode. Then allow the inert gas to pass through the cannula for several seconds. The exit bubbler needle is then inserted into a previously unpenetrated location of the same rubber septum. This relieves the pressure in the receiving vessel. Next, the free end of the cannula is inserted into a rubber septum of the appropriate vessel as per your equipment configuration. Watch the exit bubbler closely during this step. If it doesn't move, the cannula may be blocked. Immediately switch the apparatus back to passive mode if this is the case. Verify the receiving vessel is prepared before beginning to transfer. To begin the transfer, ensure that the apparatus is in active mode. The cannula is lowered into the pyrophoric liquid. After the required amount is transferred, the cannula is lifted into the headspace of the reagent bottle to stop the transfer. Before removing the tip of the cannula from the reagent bottle, wait for the remaining pyrophoric liquid to be purged from the cannula. Observe all pyrophoric liquid has been purged from the cannula before proceeding. Once the transfer is finished, set the apparatus to passive mode, then insert a second inert gas line and open the line. Remove the cannula, keeping both tips pointing away from yourself. Stick both ends of the cannula into the pincushion containing desiccant to prevent air intrusion and needle sticks. The gas line leading to the reagent container should be removed and its valve closed. Unclamp, repackage, and transport the reagent container to storage as was specified earlier using a secondary container. You may repeat the above cannula transfer as needed depending on your measuring technique for that reaction. The reaction is initiated as per your procedure, closely monitoring the rate of reaction. The cannula must be quenched and cleaned so it does not become a hazard during future use. Start by initiating a transfer of solvent through the cannula and expelling it into a container of appropriate quench agent. Repeat as needed. Next, transfer an appropriate quench agent through the cannula. If the cannula becomes blocked during this step, remove the cannula and use a cleaning wire to attempt to clear the blockage. Be cautious as there is a small potential for small sparks during this step. If the blockage persists, soak the cannula in an appropriate quencher for at least one hour and dispose of the cannula in a sharps container. If there is no cannula blockage, clean it according to your lab's procedure and store it in the oven or desiccator for future use. As a byproduct of conducting pyrophoric research, hazardous waste will be generated. Because pyrophorics have unique hazards, they should be given special consideration when it comes to disposal. Establish a relationship with the ASU Hazardous Waste Unit and consult with them during SOP planning and creation. Your SOP must include specific plans and procedures for hazardous waste collection. As previously covered during the procedures portion of training, all products and side products must be fully quenched and stable. All pyrophoric waste should be stable, separated by hazardous class, and labeled.
Once you have completed the quench procedures mentioned earlier, handle the waste as appropriate for its class with appropriate hazardous waste tag. Follow all procedures as provided in the ASU hazardous waste management training. For old or questionable containers, contact ASU EHS for assistance. Ensure all pyrophoric materials and waste are properly stored. When not in use, pyrophoric reagent bottles are stored in flammable storage cabinets or flammable rated refrigerators. An inert gas filled desiccator or glove box are suitable locations for most pyrophoric materials. Pyrophoric materials must be kept closed and sealed with parafilm, tape, or another sealant during storage. Pyrophoric and other water reactive chemicals must be properly segregated from flammable materials by using secondary containment, which often consists of the original pack packaging can. This can should be saved and dated as to when it was first opened. Bottles will not be kept in storage for periods longer than one month after their initial use. Bottles exceeding this date will be removed as hazardous waste. Perform a visual inspection of the septa prior to use to verify integrity. If the septa is compromised, consider disposing of the reagent or transferring to a new container. Remember, pyrophorics can be unpredictable. Even if the pyrophoric hasn't caught fire right away, it can spontaneously combust at any moment during or after you've evacuated the lab. Even if the lab is kept clear, emergency procedures should still include pulling a fire alarm, leaving the building, and calling 911. In closing, this course is intended to raise the awareness of the hazards of working with pyrophorics and safe work principles to be reflected in the SOPs for pyrophoric use. Researchers must follow an established SOP when working with pyrophorics. The risks are too high to deviate from known procedures. If ever unsure of a planned procedure, do not proceed until you contact someone with more experience for assistance. Never work alone when handling pyrophorics. Achieving your desired use of pyrophorics begins with applying consistent, safe work behaviors from start to finish. Completion of this course must be followed up with lab-specific training to include the specific use and application of the pyrophorics within your lab.